Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Smetona. Today we're going to discuss an idea which is very distasteful to contemporary man. It is an idea associated with the degrading of human dignity, with uh, robbing a man of his, of his worth, his obedience. With us to discuss obedience is the Reverend Clarence Kelly, spiritual father of a congregation of traditional nuns in Round Top, New York. Father Kelly, welcome to What Catholics Believe. It's a pleasure to be here, Julius. Father, in the Catholic view, what is obedience? Obedience in and of itself is the conformity of the human will with a norm of behavior. In that sense, then, to whom does the Catholic owe obedience? Well, the Catholic, first of all, owes obedience to the Creator, obviously. God made us, <coughs> excuse me, He made us for a purpose, for an end, and in order to attain that end, we must follow His instructions and directives. So what we do is we conform our will and therefore our behavior to the norms given to us by Almighty God. And in that way, we attain the end for which He made us. How do we know what these norms are? He revealed them. To whom did he reveal them? He revealed them in the Old Testament to the fathers and the patriarchs, to Abraham and to Moses. And in the New Testament, uh, he himself came, uh, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he revealed uh, the fullness of the truth uh, through his own words and then through the words of his apostles. On previous programs, we discussed obedience vis-a-vis, -vis, say, husband and wife, husband and children, governor and governed. Right. What about obedience with regard to the Catholic and the clergy, the clergy and the Catholic, the, the layman and his spiritual superior, the clergyman, the clergyman and his spiritual head, uh, member of the hierarchy? What is the relationship that governs the obedience there? Well, there is no doubt but that there is an obligation to obey <coughs> one's superiors. The Apostle Paul said, obey your prelates. So it, it's clear that since the church established by Christ is an external institution and has a hierarchy, a governing body, that clearly it is necessary for those who are subject to that hierarchy to conform their wills to the will of this period. What ex to what extent, uh, then, is the Catholic layman uh, obligated to obey the clergyman, the priest, say? Wherein does this obedience, what are the parameters that define this obedience? Well, for example, if the church makes a law saying that during Lent, you must uh, fast, mm -hmm. meaning that you eat one full meal and two light meatless meals. The church has the authority to impose that as a penance, and we who are subject to the church have the obligation to obey. What about now one, one level up? You have a clergyman and you have bishops above them. To what extent does a priest, must a priest, obey a bishop? Well, if it's his bishop, for example, if a priest is a member of a particular diocese or if he's a member of a religious congregation, then the bishop of the diocese in which he is what they call incarnated, that means he's attached to that diocese, that particular bishop has authority over that particular priest. Mm -hmm. But another bishop would not. A bishop from a different diocese would not have the authority to bind that priest. All right. It's, it's sort of like, uh, if you want to look at it from the point of view of a family, uh, you have a certain authority in your family, and your children are obliged to obey you. Mm -hmm. But you do not have the authority to command the children of another parent. What about one f the next step? Uh, who, who, to whom are the uh, bishops, say, obligated in, in obedience? Who, do, to, who, to, who does the, the bishops obey? Well, ultimately, everyone is obliged to obey the head of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And the head of the Catholic Church 
is Christ. Mm -hmm. That is an infallible doctrine of the church, that Christ is the head. Mm -hmm. St. Thomas Aquinas uh, speaks about Christ as being the king, and under Christ the king, there is a, an ambassador. And that ambassador would be the pope, and under the pope there would be subjects, bishops, for example, and under the bishops, the priests, and under the priests, the lay people. But the ultimate authority in the Catholic Church is Christ, for Christ is the head of the Catholic Church. Uh, the bishops then have to obey the pope. They do, and the pope has to obey Christ. This is very interesting because normally one associates the authority in the church with the pope, not with Christ. Not in the Catholic Church. Uh, at least not when a Catholic looks at it. it it's uh, very possible that people get that impression from certain attacks by non-Catholics on the church. Mm -hmm. But uh, from the point of view of Catholic doctrine, it is crystal clear that the ultimate authority in the church is Christ. Yeah, well, from, from the Vatican II and onward, it seems that the stress has been obedience to the Pope, obedience to the Pope, and yet you're saying that there is a well-defined area in which the Pope, too, owes obedience to higher authority. Yes, however, I would disagree with you. I don't think there has been an emphasis on obedience to the Pope since the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. I think there has been a de-emphasis. Mm -hmm. I think there is a movement within the church to destroy the prerogatives of the Roman pontiff, uh, which are mainly two. One would be his infallible teaching authority, and the second would be his universal jurisdiction over every bishop, every priest, and every individual person. And those two doctrines of the Catholic Church have been uh, diminished, if not openly denied, uh, in virtually every so-called Catholic institution of learning. The only time you hear, at least in my experience, is about obedience to the Pope, is when those people who are uh, pushing this revolution in the Catholic Church, when those people want others who don't want to go along with the revolution to go along, then they invoke the authority of the Pope. But as a general rule, there is uh, very little regard for the real prerogatives of a Roman pontiff. I'm very glad you, you mentioned this obedience to the Pope, Father, because uh, there's no secret about it. You're what's known as a <coughs> traditionalist priest, a priest who celebrates the pre-reformed liturgy, the, the, the Tridentine Mass, the Missal right. of St. Pius X. Now, I'll be quite frank with you. This statement almost seems to me similar or akin in spirit to Jimmy Swaggart attacking Jim Baker for adultery <laughs> while he himself was committing adultery. There has recently been published in the Cleveland dioceses uh, a, a warning for Catholic faithful to stay away from priests who celebrate the traditional mass. They are not in communion with the, the Pope. They are not under the local bishop. They have no authorization, so they're being disobedient, and they're not following any set rules. And you would fa fall into this category. How do you justify this? <laughs> well, I think your, uh, your analogy is very amusing. Uh, however, the fact of the matter is <clears throat> that if you understand the teaching of the Catholic Church on obedience, you will understand that we are not disobedient. Mm -hmm. There is a very big misunderstanding uh, about the nature of obedience as taught by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, the true teaching is this, that the virtue of obedience lies in the middle between two extremes. Right. Uh, the, the, the virtue is practiced when we submit to the legitimate commands of legitimate superiors. Mm -hmm. It is violated in one of two ways. One way that it's violated is if we refuse submission to legitimate commands of legitimate superiors. Mm -hmm. But the other way to sin against the virtue of obedience is by what St. Thomas Aquinas calls servile submission. And servile submission would be obedience to a sinful command or to a command which is beyond the authority of the individual 
who gives it. Are you saying that the Pope doesn't have the authority to command you to say Mass in a certain way? He does not have the authority to command me to do something which is against Catholic faith, morals, or worship. That's correct. So you're saying that the Pope is commanding you to do something wrong when he commands you to, to, to celebrate the Mass according to the reforms, even though he does it and all the bishops. You're putting yourself in a position of judging the Pope, it seems. No, I am a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic. I went to a Catholic grade school. I entered a Catholic seminary. I know what the Catholic Church teaches on faith, morals, and worship. I know the difference between a Catholic Mass and a Protestant service. It is not a question of uh, setting myself up to judge the Pope. It's a question of being simply honest. That anyone who knows anything at all about the history of the Protestant Reformation, anyone who knows anything about the teaching of uh, Catholic institutions before the Second Vatican Council, knows that these very changes were condemned before. <laughs> And so now, the changes that were condemned before are put forward as being something good. And when people say no to that, then others charge them with disobedience. And it's, it's just not so. Let me put it this way. You don't have to have a doctor's degree in agriculture to know the difference between a good apple and a rotten apple. Oh. And these changes clearly are a rotten apple. Not because I say so, but because they are in direct contradiction to the things which the popes have taught over the last 200 years. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, there was a woman who attends a traditional mass, wrote a letter to a non-traditional priest uh, criticizing him for warning people to stay away from this mass. Right. And this priest said, my bishop is in communion with the pope. I am in communion with the Pope. Are you in communion with the Pope? Let me ask you this. Are you in communion with the Pope? Well, I bet you dollars to donuts, uh, to use that expression, that that priest is not in communion with John Paul II. Because that priest, no doubt, uh, without even knowing him, I can say this, no doubt that priest counsels his people that artificial contraception is up for grabs. And that that priest himself is in a parish where that is taught and in the diocese where it's taught. But that sounds like the ad hominem abusive fallacy of irrelevance. You're saying, <laughs> well, he's in disobedience, he's not in communion, so it's okay for me not to be. Are you no, in no, communion? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that argument is dragged out only when it's a question of fidelity to the traditions of the church. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly they love the pope. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they love obedience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact of the matter is, they just drag that argument out because they know what they are doing is irreconcilable with the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church. Now, on this other, the question of does John Paul II approve of what we're doing, obviously he doesn't. There's no question about it. But the next question is this, is that disobedience? Is it disobedience to refuse to submit to these reforms and the answer is no because these reforms are by their very nature inimical they are contrary to uh, the teaching of the church on faith morals and worship and therefore we have a duty to resist these reforms and in resisting these reforms we are not being disobedient we're actually being obedient because the superior of the bishops and the superior of the pope is christ himself <laughs> And if they disobey Christ, if they use their position to harm the church and to harm souls, and if we go along with it, then we become enemies of Christ. So there's probably no doubt in anyone's mind that priests who, like yourself, say, celebrate the Tridentine Mass are an incredible minority. How could it be that a handful of you could be right when the, apparently the entire magisterium, the pope, almost every cardinal, I, not, I shouldn't say almost every cardinal, every bishop is, is against you. How can you be right and they can be wrong when Christ said, you are Peter, upon this rock I shall build my church, and uh, what you shall bind in earth shall sure. be bound in heaven, and yet you're saying, is Christ wrong, or how could this be? Well, uh, 
You know, in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew is recorded the occasion on which our Lord communicated to Peter that he would be the visible head of the church and have authority to bind and to loose. And immediately after our Lord said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Immediately after our Lord said that to Peter, Peter pulled our Lord aside, and he said to our Lord, uh, he said, I will not permit that you should go up to Jerusalem and be put to death. Okay? And you know what our Lord called Peter? Huh. This is immediately after he said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Our Lord said to him, You are Satan. <laughs> Satan. He says, Get behind me, Satan. So the question is, how could our Lord, in one sentence, say to Peter, You are the one upon whom I will build my church, and in the next sentence say, You are Satan. How could that be? And the answer simply is, that uh, Peter was the head of the church, the visible head of the church, the vicar of Christ, the ambassador of the Savior, with regard to a certain specified function. In other words, if Peter invoked his infallible teaching authority, it would have to be true what he said. But he personally was not impeccable. And therefore, he was capable of doing something which was so grossly wrong that our Lord referred to him as Peter. Yes, but... but uh, Satan. Yeah. But this, uh, it seems that it's certainly within the Pope's jurisdiction to declare what the normative mass will be. I mean, St. Pius V declared this is the normative mass. You will do such a thing. He's, he's you know, he instituted the last gospel after mass. Uh, it, it seems this is a, a difference to say that Peter, in saying that you shall not go to Jerusalem, that it's a Christ, as opposed to John Paul II saying you shall celebrate this Mass. I, uh, well, uh, let me give you an example. Let us say that something happened to a Pope, and uh, either he went crazy or lost his faith, and it was still a secret matter. Nobody knew about it. And he issues a document, and the document says, henceforth, everyone will say, the Black Mass. Okay. And he issues a decree and sends the decree out. And someone says, I can't say a Black Mass. The Black Mass is the worship of Satan. And someone comes along and says, well, he's the Pope. Pope says to say a black mass. You have to say a black mass. And he answers, well, obviously, he doesn't have to say a black mass. Now, that is a uh, sort of an exaggerated example. But in point of fact, uh, it is a good and adequate analogy because the new mass is, at best, a cheap copy of Protestant worship. And they are saying to us now, you must use the worship of Protestants. And we say we can't. Because if we use the worship of Protestants, we will become Protestants. And anyone who commands us to become Protestants is commanding us to abandon Christ. Essentially what you're saying then is that, the, 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 I see the analogy, what John Paul II is commanding you to do is akin to reject the faith. Absolutely. But this this seems in a practical order. So, so difficult to grasp that here you are, a lone priest who is effectively judging the actions of the entire magisterium. How do you know you're right? No, uh, you, have, uh, you have it a little bit backwards. I am a lone priest, so to speak, who has the Catholic faith and who wants to save his soul. And I know what the Catholic Church teaches. I'm not a theologian, but I know the catechism. I know the fundamentals of dogmatic and moral theology. I know what I profess and what I believe. And now I am told to accept things which are in contradiction to what I was raised to believe as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really faced with is, I am faced with the teaching of the church for 2,000 years, and especially the teaching of popes for the last 200 years. I am faced on one side with choosing between that and choosing between what has been given to us in the last 25 years. And none of it, by the way, 
was instituted with any semblance of infallible authority. So that's the choice. The choice is between 25 years of condemned teaching and most particularly, especially, the last 200 years of papal teaching. There is a contradiction. There is no possible way to reconcile what is going on in Catholic parishes with what the popes have taught. So that's my choice. My choice is between will I accept the teaching of the popes or will I accept this new teaching? That's the choice I have. So what it seems to come down to then is every Catholic now has to make his own decision. I mean, it seems that there, according to you, there is no clear beacon of truth. And the, the present in the world today proclaiming the gospel of Christ in a visible and authoritative manner. So laymen have to make their own choice in this. Is that well, no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say laymen, Catholic laymen, have to hold on to the faith. Uh, there is no question but that we are in the worst crisis in the history of the church. And in great measure, the church is eclipsed, as the Blessed Mother said at La Salette. The Blessed Virgin Mary said in 1846 at La Salette that Rome would lose the faith, become the seat of the Antichrist, and that the church would be, uh, be obscured. There would be an eclipse of the church. So it's not a question of telling people, do what you want and choose what you want and interpret. It's a question of telling people, you know your catechism. You know what the Catholic Church teaches. You know the Apostles' Creed. You know the Baltimore Catechism. And you must stick to that. You must stick to traditional morals, traditional faith, traditional worship, and leave the rest in God's hands. When, when our Lord decides, when this punishment has been completed, our Lord will restore things to normalcy. But in the interim, hold on to what you know to be true. Father Kelly, what would then be your advice or counsel to uh, someone who has leanings towards tradition and might even be interested in attending the, uh, the so-called traditional mass and yet is faced by letters from the bishops, a letter from their diocesan priests saying, I'm warning you to stay away from that. You are not fulfilling your Sunday obligation. These people are not in union with Rome. They don't lack proper authorization. Uh, they're not in communion with the bishop. You can't go to Mass there. What would you say to them? Well, let me just give you an illustration here from uh, Sacred Scripture. In the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles is recorded an incident in which the apostles were arrested and they were thrown into prison. Uh, let me just read these few verses for you. But the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and being filled with jealousy, seized the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison and led them out and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And so they went, and they preached the faith. And when the scribes and the Pharisees found out about it, they went out to them and said to them, you cannot teach this. And Peter gave this response. We must obey God rather than men. That was his response. They said to Peter, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and want to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And that is the answer that must be given to these bishops because these bishops have attacked the church they are teaching a new doctrine, a new morality, and have become enemies of the Catholic Church and enemies of Christ. And if the people obey these bishops, they will disobey the church and disobey Christ. My final question, Father, you said we must obey God rather than men. Doesn't the church teach that you obey God when you obey the Pope? If the Pope carries uh, out his function according to the will of his superior, and the will of his superior is Christ. It's just like Peter and our Lord. When Peter tried to talk our Lord out of going up to Jerusalem to be put to death, Peter was not carrying out his function. 
He was regarding the things of this world and not the things of our Lord. Father Kelly, uh, thank you very much for being with us and discussing this uh, very 